Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Keisha. Hello, Keisha. How are you? Hey. How are you? What's going on? I'm, I'm good. Thanks for having me here today. It's always good to see your face and catch up and, and talk about all the, all the nerdy things. <laughs> Is this a full circle moment for you from going from being a student to listening to the podcast to being on the podcast as an esteemed guest? Oh, it's, it's very surreal. It's, I was thinking like, how long ago was that? And (laughs) it's been like five and a half years. And I think honestly, the coolest part is like, I think five and a half years ago to hear like your vision for shift, like what you wanted to do. Cause you were pretty, it was pretty new still. Um, and just to see that, like you've done all of that and more. Um, and I don't think a lot of people can say that they've taken their vision and just exploded with it. So that's, it's really cool to see. Oh, thanks. I'm going to tear up. That's so, that's so adorable. <laughs> not yet. Yeah, so not you, yet. Were the, you were the first, like, uh, like I had like, I had a couple students before at my other job, but you were the first like full on gymnastics PT clinical that we had. Like, yeah, I think it was like six years ago, right? Or five or nine years ago. So it's funny to see how far it's come from like you to Jan to Jen to Meg to, I don't want to leave anybody out, Aaliyah, <laughs> everyone along the way. But I think it's been like seven gymnastics yeah. only PT and not only, but gymnastics based PTs right. that are now out working in the field, which is really cool. I mean, I feel yeah. old, but <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was an awesome opportunity that, you know, changed my career moving forward too. So very yeah. grateful for that. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I'm glad we could, we could help shout out Mike and Lenny, but um, yeah. So this podcast is a long overdue podcast. Um, I think has many angles to it that are important and I still think, I think we're going to focus on like hip flexibility, but in general, like flexibility is coming a long way and people are definitely understanding. Maybe we shouldn't just push people down into stretching, which is good. But I still think if I was an average coach who wasn't a medical provider and a massive dork, I would feel very stressed out and overwhelmed with like, okay, well, like I used to do these four things, but now I'm hearing these things don't work or they're not the ideal or they're dangerous. And like, I don't know what to do instead because I have to get switch leaps and like, I have to get a split, like help. Like that's how I would feel. I'm not sure if you feel the same. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, when you start coaching early on, like all you have really is your own personal experience. And so what worked for me as an athlete doesn't work for all the gymnasts that I coach. Mm. And that's something, you know, if you just keep forcing what worked for you, it's, it's going to run you into a lot of trouble with a lot of athletes that aren't the same because everyone's different. Sure. And I think it's good to kind of just highlight how you and I have a very overlapping situation, which is like both were gymnasts, both competed in college, both have been coaching for a long time, both work as PTs, but also have our sports board and our strength coaches. So it's like, I think when we offer help or suggestions, it comes from a position of empathy and knowing where you're at, but also like we've seen some things, man, from like the last, you know, what, five years of your career and maybe 10 years of my career is that we have gone the traditional route of gymnastics flexibility and stretching and have seen maybe the not so great effects of that. And then we've been actively coaching, but actively treating and like trying to digest research and change what we're doing. So if we can summarize some things and maybe update people with new things to do, I think that that's, that's an important perspective that we have, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And also too, you're uh, an appropriate person to chat about this because you unfortunately were you know, the, the negative outcome of some of these not so ideal flexibility methods. Do you mind sharing like what you've been through with your hips? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, I competed through college. Um, and I always had the, you know, hip flexor strain, quote unquote, hip pain since I was probably 12, um, for cultural reasons, didn't really say much, just kept pushing. I did all the flexibility stuff that isn't ideal that, you know, we'll kind of dig into more here, but the ankle weights and over splits and getting pushed down and, um, to catches and stalders and aerials and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it always bothered me, never really said much and, you know, flash forward 10 plus years after graduating. And I've now had 10 hip surgeries in the last three years. Oh my um, God but we're done. Last one was like three weeks ago. So we're done. Um, and they, they feel better than I, they have since I was 12, which is Mm. awesome. But, um, you know, labral repairs, reconstructions, hip dysplasia, osteotomies to fix all that essentially just stuff that because of the lack of knowledge that, you know, was available at that time to coaches and to athletes, 
I was pushed down in splits and I had hip dysplasia and it caused all these kind of problems that down the road just got to the point where, you know, as an adult, I wasn't able to walk normally. I was limping. Mm. I couldn't run. I couldn't hike. I couldn't bike. Um, and I kind of yeah. lost, you know, quality of life because of things that were done when I was younger that, you know, was never malicious. It was just a lack of knowledge that was available um, sure. at that time for, for coaches. And so, um, you know, this whole flexibility issue, the hips, um, and working with gymnasts is kind of by default become something that I've been very interested in because, mm. um, I was unaware of that, you know, as an athlete and even early on in my coaching career. So yeah, I've had 10 surgeries, multiple labral reconstructions, um, an osteotomy, which in short is just, they cut and rotate the pelvis to essentially create better coverage of the joint. Mm. So now I am not flexible, but my mm. hips feel great. So yeah. Yeah. And yes. I think there's a, there's a, a cautionary error here, which is like, sometimes people say like, well, gymnastics is hard. And like, that's what happens to hips when you do gymnastics. Like it's not the flexibility or there's so many layers here, like the flexibility, there's the, still the lack of evidence-based strength conditioning and, um, you know, weight training. There's the aspect of early specialization and year round training. There's all that kind of stuff that's stirring the pot of not saying that you're not going to get injured if we had a beautiful optimistic world, but like all these things have significant research behind them to increase the risk of injuries in particular, you know, hip and shoulder injuries, which is where the most flexibility, you know, focus is in gymnastics. So I don't think we're saying that everything's wrong, throw it all out. Like, how dare you? We're saying like, there's a lot of great research and some of the stuff we'll cover. I have some articles pulled up about like, there's definitely some more ideal ways to go about this that can get you the balance of split leaps and switch rings and switch sides and stall there's and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, can maybe optimize the long-term health of the hip joint. Absolutely. And when you had yours, uh, did you said your started as just like my hip flexor was cranky and like, did you ever have like a growth plate hamstring stuff at all? Like, like apophysitis issues too? Nothing and nothing hamstring. Um, yeah. at least for me, I know it's super common across the board for gymnasts. Personally, it was all like deep in the joint catching, you know, I lost my split performance. I lost mm. power kind of all in the front flex hip flexor strain mm. is, you know, they were like, is it was chalked up as. Yeah. Um, and you were, and you said you were 12 when it first started happening. What was your like path of like, at what age did you do what level and like on the career track of, of NCAA and stuff? Um, so I was an optional at level nine. And so I think by the time I was 12, I was probably like a level nine. Yeah. Um, like level 10 by like what? 13, 14, uh, 15. Yep. So cool. I did. Yeah. But you know, I started training to catch when I was, around that age drills and in bars and um aerials and front aerials and all that sort of yeah. stuff and yeah um yeah. And that's one of the, the things I think to cover first is we want to be really honest with this and saying that like, we're probably going to bring up some things within the culture that might stoke some fires and people will be like, Oh my God, Dave's and Keisha said this, but like all of this comes from a position of love and we're not going to offer a problem without a solution for any of these things. So like we hope to raise some concern about why and really help people understand so that when they talk to parents or when they talk to other coaches or when they talk to people who are maybe a little more old school, they can have some science-based real explanation of why and then maybe they can point those people towards this podcast and they can hear that we're not like you know going to light the, the the doors on fire and try to you know say it's all we've made all these mistakes ourselves as coaches so yeah. um yeah so let's let's kind of get into it and start with first is there's this concept that i think we've learned from mike and lenny in the base bar world which is that somebody can be loose jointed but be still stiff and lose range of motion from a, from a soft tissue flexibility point of view so can you just maybe share that concept of like what that means and why that's important for hip flexibility yeah, absolutely. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. So like golf ball on a tee. And essentially there's so many muscles that surround it to make it stable. Like it's supposed to be stable. We walk on it. So it needs to be stable. Now what happens when you do splits is if you're not in the proper position or we're not correctly stretching, it's going to end up that ball and socket joint is going to move around and it's going to start to put pressure on the capsule, the ligaments and all these what we call static stretch structures, which are essentially just, they're designed to keep things stable, right? They're supposed to be tight and stable and hold things in place. But when we're stretching, if we put too much stress on those structures, everything else, your brain, the muscles around it, don't, don't like it. They mm -hmm. recognize it's supposed to be a stable joint. They don't like that 
extra pressure on those structures. And so the muscles are going to tighten up. And you're going to get this almost like reflexive tightening, mm. which is the athlete that makes you feel tight. Mm. So once you get those muscles tightening around to protect the joint, you get that soft tissue tightness, you start stretching more. Mm. Now you're stretching more, but if you're not stretching correctly, it's just this cycle of now you're stretching the wrong things. The muscles get tight reflexively and you feel tight. So you try to stretch and it just becomes a cycle instead of, you know, are we, are we stretching in the right position? Are, is our pelvis in the right place? Are we actually stretching the quad? Are we actually stretching hamstrings instead of um, putting this pressure on, on what's supposed to be stabilizing the joint. And I think especially in gymnastics and splits, that's a very common um, misconception essentially is Mm -hmm. like what you're stretching with some of these stretches that we do every day. Right. And so beyond that is like, I think people hear about like the labrum all the time is like one of the main things. And so I want you to maybe just share with people what the labrum is. And then we'll pull up, I'll pull up a couple of research articles here about like why maybe the inappropriate either dosage or methodology behind stretching can stress the labrum, can stress the joint capsule, which is where like a lot of the hot water starts. Yeah, definitely. So the labrum is a donut shaped piece of tissue that lies between the femur and the acetabulum. So essentially it's just, it's designed for shock absorption and distributing forces and protecting the joint and making sure that the load that goes through those two bones, when you're walking, running, jumping, leaping, tumbling, um, that that force, those forces are dissipated and um, spread out across the joint to protect it um, and to keep it safe from these higher higher forces. Now, when you're doing splits or you're stretching, what can happen is as you move into these end ranges of motion, you can stress that labral tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very similar to like the meniscus in the knee or the labrum in the shoulder. It has a similar type of purpose. Um, but as you go to those end ranges, you're going to start to stretch or to stress rather that labral tissue that can become cranky and potentially irritate or, you know, tear it, which does right. compromise the, um, the structure of the joint in terms of the seal that it provides, the ability to dissipate forces and things like that. Yeah. And there's a couple of really important things you said there. So one is that this, this structure, this labrum serves as not only a shock absorber, but it also serves as something that's really like helping with that suction seal. It's a closed vacuum system. So when you're young and you have a, you know, a fully intact labrum and there's no stress going through that, that's tearing it, it's a really good suction to joint, but there's this small, you know, vicious circle that happens, which is if you have natural laxity in gymnastics or you have extra laxity getting happening over time because we're stretching joint capsules out, if we start to tear and or damage that labrum, we lose that suction seal. We lose that stability. We lose that. And that causes a re- like, you know, again, you you lose some some stability. You start to stretch more. It gets more lax and then lose some more. And that's how you get to a progressive labral tear, which is where somebody over time has some problems. But the second piece of that, too, is that the the labrum and then also the joint itself has pain receptors right so this is something that can create pain it's not just like a a passive you know piece of like just flubber that just sits in there and doesn't have any pain it it can be very very painful as you as you unfortunately know yeah yeah absolutely and then here i'll bring up this picture trigger warning it's a little gross if you're not into anatomy it's a cadaver hip so can you kind of just like share maybe or orient somebody with what what they're seeing here on the screen this is a great article from this is a long time ago. This is grow, but this is like one of the first articles I remember reading on like seeing this like in person. So like, what, what are we looking at when we look at this picture? Yeah. So I'll, it's a little small on my end, but I'll go with what I can see and I'll let you kind of fill in the, the um, gaps. But so basically we're seeing kind of that on the l- more left side, that whole circle there, that's the acetabulum. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the socket. That's where the leg bone comes in um, to the pelvis. And then on the right, that it's like a half circle. That's the femur. So that's the, the thigh bone. Um, and on the rim, right around mm-hmm. that circle there, it's kind of like an off white colored tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the labrum. So that's what provides that seal, that suction um, and that protection to the joint there. So cool. you can kind of see it's very like flush with the joint. Yeah. So if it does get um, compromised or torn or anything like that, that seal um, is quickly compromised. Definitely. Right. And so this is kind of like at the bone level, right? And then I'll kind of pull up this next article, which is for any medical providers, you should read this one like 94 times. Oh, I love this, that is, article. Uh, this is from Calsvart and Stefran. This is one of the bigger eye opening ones for me, but you can see now, and I'll kind of point this out because the colors are small, but you can see here how this is like a, 
uh, a visual representation via like computer and modeling, but like you can see these are the main ligaments that surround. So you can see in here, if I zoom in, that's the labrum that you can see right here on the outside that Keisha was talking about in the last photo. But then you can see here how on top of this hip joint, we have uh, the iliofemoral ligament here. We have the pubofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament. These are like these giant kind of capsular like uh, ligaments that then add extra suction on top of that. So it's the bone, the golf ball, and the tee. It's the labrum, which is that inner coating. And then we have kind of the ligaments and the joint capsule around it, which are now really trying to hug in and keep this nice and stable. And you can probably understand how if you are doing extreme ranges of motion in gymnastics or stretching or stuff like that, there's more uh, risk of, of, of stretching and putting improper pressure on the ligaments and on the joint capsules. And so that is where some of our, our concern and our fear comes up, which is if we're not using science-based screening and evidence-based flexibility methods, we're not using the proper dosage, and maybe we're getting, letting go of some of the old school things that we think put more pressure on these ligaments and these hip joints, ankle weights being one we'll talk about. This is why we're, we're, we're concerned. And this is what we see happen sometimes in, in gymnasts who are doing a lot of stretching, a lot of jumps, a lot of leaps while they're growing, because it puts a lot of pressure on these structures, which are very, very uh, painful, but also you can't get this back, right? You can't like get your, your once the labrum you had or the cartilage you had or your ligaments, they can repair it, but it's never the same once you finally start damaging these things. And so that's kind of just like the, the background of, of why these things are important No, Yeah. And I think it's kind of like you said, it's important to note that those structures, unlike muscle, they're not contractile. So once mm -hmm. we stretch them, they don't, they don't go back. You know, it's not like you stretch it out in a split and then all of a sudden it goes back to its original length. Once, mm -hmm. once that tissue, those ligaments, that capsule is stretched out, um, you you can't change that right exactly you can't change that without sure surgery <laughs> yeah and so i think this is the last thing i want to show is is that we kind of see if we were to zoom in really far on this i just grabbed like a google image but if we see like down inside the hip joint is all the stuff we just talked about is behind this little like ring right here right so here you can see on the front we see the hip flexor muscle which actually starts up here at the spine which is a very important thing we'll come back to it kind of blends all the way through and that hip flexor muscle goes down in front of the hip joint and attaches to the femur we have the uh, one of the quad muscles that starts up here on the pelvis that's also on top but then we have these giant groin muscles that are also very close here. So sometimes the reason I say this is sometimes it's very hard to understand as in your experience of like, it feels like a hip flexor strain because it's directly in the same area, right? As a hip flexor strain would be, but underneath in the layers deeper, we have these ligaments and then in layer deeper, we have the labrum and we have the joint. So all of these things are very much stacked on top of each other. And it's very easy to say like, oh, it's just a hip flexor strain or like on the back, oh, it's just a hamstring strain, you know, no big deal. But in reality, we have this really important hip flexor, this quad, we have groin muscles, and we want to make sure we're setting up the, the type of stretching and soft tissue work to really target the muscles and stay away from this ligament or, you know, this labrum, right? Absolutely. Cool. Cool. Okay. So that's a really important thing to start with, right? So just if you're following along and you're not a dork like us, so you can be loose jointed and stiff muscular point of view as, as a beginning point. So gymnasts are typically hypermobile in their joint capsules. And so we already have la natural laxity. Like you kind of get naturally selected in gymnastics to be good at this because you know, if you weren't really naturally lax, you probably wouldn't be able to do any sort of splits or stuff like that. Um, but also is the more you do repetitive movements. So say jumping and leaping and sprinting, squeezing your legs together, those muscles, the hip flexor, the quad, the groin, they can get quite stiff. And that can be really what we want to focus on for flexibility methods. And then also as people grow naturally, the bones grow faster than the muscles can keep up with. And that's the majority of young athletes. So that is why you see someone who loses range of motion and gets into a situation. And it's so important. So we do want to stretch. We do want to manage the soft tissue, but we're just trying to bias, you know, bias the soft tissue structures, what you call, you know, the, the dynamic stabilizers, right? Yep, absolutely. Those are, you know, there's so many things in this like idea of flexibility that can focus on those things and focus on the muscle, focus on tissue lengthening and not just joint capsule stretching. And I think, like you said, the big is gymnastics is inherently, these athletes are going to be flexible. That's kind of what drew them to the sport. That's why they're successful. And that's great. Mm. But we also have to recognize that with our flexibility complexes, with our training, with our workload, we're going to stress that capsule mm. inherently based on the pivoting on a fixed leg and ranges of motion, all these things that are just part of the sport. So if we know that's going to happen, we have to do everything we can to kind of combat that and not fuel the fire. Sure. 
Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good intro. So the second intro out of three I want to cover before we we jump into stuff is I think something that was very eye opening for me in PT school was was starting to see that splits or getting your arms over your head or doing a straddle or something like that or a pancake. Those are patterns of motion that actually have a lot of things that go into making them be successful, right? So I used to just think as a younger coach and a gymnast, like, oh need a better split, do more splits. If I need shoulder flexibility, lay on the ground, somebody pulls my arms over my head. Right. And then as I got farther along into this, uh, you know, anatomy understanding, I, I was like, Oh, wait, there's actually like a lot of things that have to go well, which will lead to our conversation around screening. So can you maybe share, let's just use a front split, for example, like, can you just share like a whole bunch of things that have to go right for someone to get a split from like the bone and then all the way out to maybe like some of the musculature that's involved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, if we start with the bony level, like they have to, their, um, thigh bone and their hip socket, like essentially they have to have enough availability within that joint to move it all the way into full flexion. So all the way out in front without like those bones knocking up against each other, because that can cause pain and irritation. So from a bony level in front, they've got to be able to kind of have the clearance in the joint to get to that position. Similarly on the back leg, they've got to be able to have the clearance in that direction to, to get into that position. Mm -hmm. um, on the next level, the muscles, it's not just one muscle. So, you know, a split is not just hamstrings or just quads. There's deep hip rotators, there's smaller muscles, there's nerve tension to consider all of which can change what, you see in a split, what an athlete feels, things like that. So you have to worry about muscles and nerves, um, positioning, posturing. So if someone, I think we see a lot of time as coaches, someone slides out 10 splits and they're not square. They're kind of like what we would call hanging out on their ligaments. Just, mm -hmm. um, they're not active in that posture. And if you're not actively engaged, you can get issues with not being able to achieve the right position either because you're not your pelvis potentially isn't in a position that is advantageous to allow for the legs or the muscles to get into that optimal flexibility position. Totally. Yeah. And I think an important thing to bring up here is, is this, uh, you know, if you're listening to this, we have an x-ray pulled up that has essentially some of the measurements that we use to look at to see if somebody has that first layer, which is what Keisha was talking about, which is how deep is your hip socket, right? So like you have to have some degree of dysplasia to do a, a full split. And what I mean by that is that the, the, sh the, the shallowness of the hip socket has to be more than the average human, right? So like here, for medical providers, the things you want to look at is a, a, is a lateral center age angle, which is this, uh, you know, perpendicular line relative to the lateral acetabulum to kind of see what that angle is. And then over here, you have a tonus angle, which again, is the top of the sphere relative to the, the outside of the acetabulum. So these are just indexes of looking at is someone just dysplastic in general. And I think before we kind of chat more in the patterns, it's important to realize that there's a, a crazy study that was here was essentially they had ballet dancers do full splits, as you can see here in this image, had them do full um, middle splits on an x-ray table and take x-rays of their hips. And what they found was just to get into this full abducted kind of straddle split position, you had to have some degree of, of the actual bones themselves sliding out of the hip socket. To, to get into a full split. And it's not to say don't do splits, right? That's just like a, the nature of the beast with uh, the sport. But if a full split already is getting someone's hip joints to slide out of the socket slightly, like in a micro in a micro movement point of view, I think like four millimeters is what the average was here in the study. Yeah. We have to realize that the hip already the joint sliding out a little bit. And we have someone who's really hypermobile. If you have someone who has really stiff, soft tissue flexibility and you say, Hey, just go do over splits or just stretch. Well, where's that motion going to come from? It's going to come from the already lax joint and it's going to come from the bone itself. That's kind of sliding a little bit typically. So we really want to make sure that we understand from a screening point of view, how to screen out if somebody has bony limitations. So using a Craig's test or using some sort of, uh, you know, um, x-ray if you're a medical provider, but then also as a coach, you have to understand what goes into a right and left split as Keisha is saying here. So you have to understand that on the front leg, it has to be, the hamstring has to be mobile. The nerve has to be able to move in the back leg. It has to be the hip flexor, the quad, the groin. We have to understand that the, the more we arch or hollow our pelvis, that changes how far we can go down in a split. And also realize that some people's hips are shaped very differently. Some people won't be able to have a full straddle split because they have a very unique hip socket. So as a coach, you have to either work with medical providers or understand the screening tools yourself to figure out, is this a hip flexor thing? Is it a quad thing? Is it a strength thing? Is it a hamstring thing? Because if we don't know that and we just say go stretch, 
we're going to miss the boat on what the actual issue is. And we're probably going to uh, maybe increase the risk of some long-term problems down the road. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot more to it. And I think we, these don't work in isolation either, right? Like a front mm -hmm. split and a side split and a pancake and a pike, like they all help complement each other based on the muscles and um, like what they're working. Mm, and exactly. like you said, the back leg, it's, you know, adductors, it's quads, it's hip flexors. Well, pancake is adductors too. And middle is partially adductors. And so there's, you know, they all kind of play into each other, um, which is partially too why kids struggle with multiple positions. Right. Um, and on that too, I think we, the third thing I want to, so we kind of have the first one, which is loose and tight at the same time. The second one being, these are patterns. We have to screen them out. We have to kind of earn the right to do over splits. If we're going to train them and someone who's got a full regular split has core control, has strong active engagement. But the third thing I think to set the stage of why we're going to suggest people maybe do this, not that in the next couple sections is we have to understand the main mechanisms of injuries in hips for gymnasts, right? So one being, labral and or like micro instability and then the fulcrum mechanism which i'll pull up a paper and we'll show that on um but then also we'll talk about growth plate so let's talk about maybe labral tears and hip flexor and or groin issues in the context of micro instability and fulcrum and then we'll talk about growth plate and kind of those would be the two main ones that i think people are going to understand the best yeah for sure um do you want to pull up that extra picture find... again with the that just shows it so well the uh which one the x-ray the middle splits. Yeah, the dancers where yes. we get the oh. micro instability. Oop. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So essentially, like with fulcruming, essentially, if you look at that second B picture, what's happening is as they go into abduction and that uh, the lateral part of the femoral head, it hits up against the acetabular wall and it causes that sliding inferiorly in the hip joint so that they can reach the you know straddle position but that's that's causing that micro instability that full crimming off one end so you, um we tend to say like you get bony impingement in one area meaning bones kind of collide together and it's going to cause an instability or a sliding in a different direction so we see that in middle splits we see that in front splits in the front leg and the back leg it just kind of depends where on that socket the bones are going to um, pinch or collide which is mm -hmm. going to determine which direction the hip kind of gets unstable or slides and we cause that um, potential micro instability mm -hmm. and i'll give the uh the coaching non-medical version of that with my wonderful stick figures that i draw for for lectures so here you can see essentially what we've summed up so far is that the first layer we have here is the pelvis and the the hip bone like Keisha was saying and then beyond that we have the labrum inside here and then we have the ligaments that are on top of that and then we have the muscles that are then on top of that hip flexor, core and quad, whatever. So three layers on top of each other. And what Keisha is saying here is kind of demonstrated right here, which is essentially when you do a switch leap. So say, let's take the back leg, for example, if an athlete swings their leg really far back and they have maybe some of this contact between the back of the thigh bone and the, in the hip bone, well, they run out of room. And essentially what happens is that then fulcrums out the front. So the leg swinging in the back causes the, the front of the, the ball of the hip joint to slide forward. And as we talked about, the labrum is right up here. The hip flexor is right up here. The joint capsule is right up here. So the leg swings back really far, makes bony contact, and then the front of the hip joint goes forward as a reaction. And that's where you get some anterior labral issues. You get some uh, joint laxity issues. You get some hip flexor strains because the hip flexor tendon, the quad tendon is trying to keep that from sliding out the front of the joint. And there was actually a paper, I forget who the author was, I think it was like 2016 that showed that those athletes with instability, but didn't have like bony issues. So they didn't have any cam or pincher lesions. They tend to have three o'clock lesions on, on a, on a clock face. So if you look at a clock face like this, you know, this is the wrong hip. So it'd be nine o'clock in this one. But essentially if you look at a clock face from one all the way down to 12 back, they look at where the labral tear is in relation of that person's injury. And a lot of these, you know, gymnasts, dancers, switch sleep, you know, cheerleaders, they had a lot of lesions and labral tears on the nine o'clock position for this left hip. And it would be a three o'clock position on the other hip, because this is what's happening is the ball of the head is sliding forward and it's pulling on that labrum from like a, an overload from the front going out, which is called an eccentric contraction. So this might be why you have that hip flexor tightness or that groin tightness, because those muscles are desperately trying to keep the hip joint from sliding around a little bit. Is that uh, 
Am I accurate there? Am I missing something? No, absolutely. And you know, you do that over and over and over and over and over again. And that labrum is not designed to handle those type of sheer stresses um, mm-hmm. at that force, at that repetition, and it, it starts to break down and causes that that pain. Which you know, does that then lead to a hip flexor, tight mm-hmm. knee, or tendonitis, mm-hmm. whatever we want to you know yep. throw it into issue? Yep. And that's um, you know. That might be what we see, but understanding this as the cause of it is so important. Exactly. Right. And this exact same mechanism is what Keisha was talking about with the splits here is that you're still, you're, you're sliding up into a straddle split. So you're doing a switch side or you're doing like a really deep pancake or an in bar or something like that. The outside of the hip bone is hitting the outside of the hip joint and it's sliding down now. So instead of going forward and backwards, it's going outside and pushing it down and you can have issues in the bottom of the joint with like your, again, your groin with your inferior labrum and stuff like that. And you can also see it too really well in this article by Weber, which again, is like a phenomenal read for anybody trying to digest this information. This is in 2015, I want to say, um, in uh, sports health, but essentially you can see here the types of people who have these problems, right? You see that in here, you see a switch leap where this, that, that back leg is swinging backwards. The bony contact is being made here and it slides the hip joint forward. So she probably feels pain in this back leg here, but then over here on bars, you can see someone who has this really wide straddle cast handstand, which is what something so many people do thousands of. And you can kind of see that same kind of concept of maybe causing bony impingement on the top and having inferior subluxation. She's upside down. So obviously that's part of it. But then you see this also happen here in, you know, ballerinas or ice skaters or, you know, uh, different types of dancers. That is typically where this mechanism happens. And then also you can have a similar type of compression on the front of the joint here. So you can see an athlete, a dancer here who is kicking extremely high in the front and that can cause the front of the hip joint to impinge as well. So sometimes it's in the back leg because you swing that leg back and it hits and it leans forward. Or sometimes it's in the front leg where you kick so hard, so high that it causes compression of the front of the, the, you know, the, the right leg in the front or the left leg in the back would be the other option. So yeah, that, um, I think that's as far as we, we probably should go with in terms of dorkiness, but that essentially is the, the main mechanism for why so many athletes have hip pain. It's very different than other types of labral tears, but it's going to be a very important thing to keep in your mind as we talk about some things that maybe should go and things that can be replaced that. So let's shift gears and talk about the other side of the equation, which is like more of a growth plate related injury. So let's say like a, a, a hamstring uh, growth apophysitis, for example, what's the, what's the mechanism going on there? Because it's a little bit different than that one. For sure. Um, there's usually a couple things here. We see it a lot when an athlete just grows a lot. Um, cause like you said, their bones grow much faster than their muscles. So they've grown, their bones have grown, but their muscles haven't quite caught up, but they're still doing all these leaps, all these jumps, all these big skills. And, um, that can really end up pulling on that bony attachment, uh, where the hamstring muscle comes in and attaches to essentially the sit bone on the pelvis. So, um, work or growing is a big one. And then workload, we don't consider, you know, you get a new split leap complex from, I don't know, Congress or whatever it is. And you, you go back and you immediately implement that. And now the workload for the amount of leaps that they've gone through has just doubled or tripled. And, and that kind of spike in workload can really trigger some of these hamstring apophysitis issues. Um, as well as similar to what we've touched on is just this stretching in a way that's poten- that's not ideal. Mm. Um, if someone has poor posture and they're always as, a lot of gymnasts really are in that kind of anterior pelvic tilted position or um, simply just like lumbar lordosis, or they have their back slightly arched all the time. Um, that puts the hamstrings essentially in this position of stretch or preloaded all the time when they're standing, when they're walking, when they're doing skills, whatever it might be. So that hamstring muscle is never in an optimal position for, for movement, for activation, for getting in and out of positions and that can cause some extra load and irritation, um, in that age on that growth plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to show a couple of pictures to solidify this. So this is just a, again, a random Google image, but essentially this is the growth plate where Keisha is talking about, which is up into the sit bone. You feel that high in your buttock, but you see these giant muscles, the three muscle branches of the hamstrings come together into one conjoined tendon. And when you're growing, when you're 10, 11, 12, this bone is not fully formed. It's not fully fused yet. So your femur is growing very fast. These muscles can't keep up. Then you're doing running for vault. You're doing switch leaps. You're doing splits. You're doing step ins for in bars. You're doing all sorts of different jumps and leaps. All of the tension of that muscle and the contraction is getting pulled on 
that growth plate that's a soft, not fully formed bone. So you can see a lot of people will have these high hamstring issues. Again, a very good point you made, which is like the workload spike, which is got a bunch of new drills, not maliciously, but like they look fun on Instagram and you want to do them and you want to get those, those, the, you know, the leap angles up. So we throw a lot at the athlete in a very short period of time. And it causes this kind of like irritation of the bone. And these things are notoriously frustrating to, to deal with because once you kind of stir the pot and it gets inflamed, every time you calm down, it, you grow a little bit, or you try to go back and there's so many things that require your hamstring on every event. It's really hard to get over this. So this is the example of the, it's kind of like an, uh, a growth stretch related issue, but we also have these same types of growth plates all over the front of the hip joint. And the hip joint itself, that's one of the last growth plates to fuse, right? They start farther and they work their way up. So that's why you have like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds who struggle with this because these are the last things to fully fuse. So you can see a couple really important ones here, which is we have some attachment points of the rectus femoris and some of the groin muscles, the abdominal muscles, the hamstrings in the back, you can see here as well. But you also have this uh, hip flexor attachment comes down and attaches right to this one right here. And while not a, not a huge growth plate, um, uh, attachment, it still is one and so much flexing of the hip over and over with jumping and leaping and leg lifts and all that kind of stuff. If someone's in the, in the mixture of growing fast and doing lots of gymnastics, moving up level eight, level nine, level 10, this is where you have someone who has these, these situations pop up. So, okay, cool. So that all makes sense, right? So the three, again, just the summary here, cause this is a little bit, you know, dorky, like I said, so the three big things to consider are one, you can have loose joints and you can have tight muscles, which creates limited flexibility, range of motion. We want to bias the muscles, leave alone the labrum, leave alone the ligaments, right? Number two, patterns are full for splits and for handstands and for straddles and pancakes. You can't just treat them as I need a pancake. I'll do a pancake. You need to break down what muscles are involved with the PT or yourself and figure out, okay, it's the hamstrings, the groin, whatever. And three is that if you understand how hip injuries occur with that, that instability, that micro fulcrum mechanism, and then also growth plates, when we get now into some of the things we'll talk about, it kind of has more of like a light bulb, like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I understand why maybe we got to move away from that. So yeah, Keisha, is there anything that you want to maybe add in before we move on to like some of these, you know, important, uh, changes? Oh man. Um, no, I just, I love how, like, we're finding out so much more about this. It is all super important stuff to kind of piece together and understand since there's, it's a lot more complex than I think we initially realized. And if understood well, I would argue that you can get to the outcomes you want faster than just, um, you know, maybe the cultural problems we had before of push, 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 and you'll get there. Um, so I think that's like, that's the silver lining. Yeah. And I would totally agree with that too, because again, the thought process is like the fear of the unknown, which is like, okay, well, what am I going to do to get my splits, to get my leap angles, to get my little kids to get their full angles. And the, and the reality is that when you think about what Keisha said in the beginning, which is when you irritate the hip joint or you do too much stretching to the joint capsule, you actually get the opposite, which is you get reflexive guarding because the hip joint is trying to stay stable. Like we love gymnastics, but your brain does not care about, you know, switch leaps. It cares about keeping your hip not not sore and not painful and, and protected. So you might actually be kind of running uphill at the wrong uh, method because you're, you're causing some irritation here. So, okay, cool. All right. Let's go through the things that are for sure on people's minds. So let's talk about ankle weights first. Why are one, are ankle weights good to use? And two, if not wink, um, yes. what, what is the reasoning behind that? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of twofold. But if based on kind of what, you know, path we've been going down, if you think back to that fulcruming mechanism, think physics, right? So if I put an ankle weight on, that's really far from the hip joint. But what I'm doing is I'm creating a really, really big lever arm for a problem that already exists at the hip joint. So if that same leverage um, issue is happening, if I put an ankle weight further, like away from the hip joint, it's just going to load up the hip, it's going to make that whole mechanism like exponentially harder on the joint. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that, you know, I know what the idea is and why we used to use them, but it's really just magnifying an instability and a fulcruming mechanism at the hip that's going to stress the labral tissue. It's going to irritate the hip faster because now you have more forces going through that joint. Um, and just, it's going to make the hip really cranky from both a front leg and a back leg perspective. Um, so that's number one in terms of probably not a great idea to use them is, is how it's going to irritate the hip joint. But two is if someone doesn't have full splits against gravity, adding ankle weights is not going to all of a sudden make them have full splits against gravity, right? Like that doesn't, 
makes sense. If I can't, if I can't squat 200 pounds, putting 225 pounds on isn't going to make it so I can magically squat 200. It just, it doesn't, you know, if you don't have it against gravity, there's another, there's a better option um, for, for using something with splits and stuff exactly. and, and training and stuff. Exactly. And you can kind of see this back to this, this kind of representation just to kind of drive the point home is that when you swing your leg really hard, again, by having an ankle weight down here, because there's such a distance from your hip joint to where the ankle weight is, it's going to further magnify those problems we talked about. It's going to further slide the hip joint around. It's going to be really hard for the smaller muscles of your hip to keep things in a good snug position. And that's where we start to get into issues with labral irritations, hip flexor strains, groin strains, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's, it's very, very well said. The other thing I think it's worth mentioning too is sometimes uh, you said it pretty well with like not having a full split, but I think what kids need sometimes is a screen to figure out what musculature is excessively stiff and or do we need some like glute rotator, some hamstring, some direct glute training to get them stronger to lift against gravity. They they actually might need some band assistance to get into full range of motion to start with. And I think that's moving to a creative solution is I think bands are obviously well known in the community and people probably use both, but bands are a much better option to kind of do some of this resisted if it's appropriate. But so why are bands maybe a better option than ankle weights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it depends how you use the band, right? So if I use the band as an essential, you know, putting it over both ankles and then they're doing tr split jumps on trampoline, it's essentially the same thing as having ankle weights at that point. However, if you design it so it's band assisted, meaning when you're kicking, that band is helping lift to those end ranges of motion. Now you're not overloading the hip joint, but you're assisting muscles to end range so that they can learn stability, positioning and posture so that when they're leaping, jumping, et cetera, you've now built this pattern and created a more protected hip joint at that range. Yep. And I'll show uh, a video because I know people are probably very curious, but here you can see yeah. she is doing band assisted, right? So she's got the band over her shoulder and it's helping pull her back leg up into her end range of motion. It's something that's being like helped out to get full range, but she's very much using her like her glute and her hamstring and stuff. And here you see one that's pretty popular too, which is band assisted straddle lifts or sorry, front lift. So the band is over her shoulder and she's lifting her front leg up. The band is helping her get to end range and she's using her hip flexor and her quad to kind of bridge that gap. It's not like it's only resisted. So this would be a good bridge to help somebody start and slowly increase getting full range of motion. Again, if someone is not able to lift their leg against gravity, adding band resistance is only going to make that more pronounced and probably create compensation. So for people who struggle with these, you can use these band assistance versions for a couple of weeks. And then maybe you go against gravity with doing tumble track jumps or doing jump and leap circuits or stuff like that. And then if somebody does get really advanced, this is from a blog post, by the way, if people want to find it, if people get really advanced, then you can start putting resistance on, on top of that. Right. So that would be my kind of second um, caveat to this too, is that Bands are oftentimes better because if you cut the band to the right length for the athlete, which is a pain in the butt, don't get me wrong. But if you put someone in like a handstand and do a straddle split and you cut the distance measured to their body and you kind of keep different lengths for different athletes within reason of your financial budget, you have constant tension throughout the entire range of motion when you do a jump or when you do a leap or when you do something for uh, like kicks or whatever on the ground versus an ankle weight depending on where that ankle weight is in the kick, it's a very different force on the hip. So it might be extremely hard in part of the range of motion and then extremely easy in the end range of motion, which is causing that overload versus a band. Generally, the toe, the toe is taken up in the middle, but the entire range of motion has more resistance that's, that's accommodating. And that's kind of what you want, right? Yeah, absolutely. So summary for people that are trying to find the, the bare bones, and we'll timestamp this, Becky, please timestamp these podcasts so people can find them. Ankle weights aren't great because they put more stress on the hip joint and they oftentimes exaggerate the problems that create hip pain in the first place for gymnasts. The second alternative is that we should screen the athletes out and figure out why they can't do the split or why they can't do it. We should try to get a full split on the ground. And if we are going to use bands, which are a good alternative, we want band assistance first. And then as they mature and as they get against gravity, then we can add band resistance to kind of get full tension throughout the entire range of motion. I think that that sums that up pretty well. No. Yeah, I like it. Definitely. Okay, cool. So second one, which is are over splits bad for gymnasts, Keisha? Maybe. It depends, of course, like all this stuff, right? Um, if you have someone who has labral irritation, they've got micro instability and you are getting this fulcruming mechanism, if they're just hanging out in middle or in over splits, 
it's only fueling the fire. Mm -hmm. I think I do use over splits. I will say that, but I'm very selective about who does them, how they do them and what position they're in. You know, you have to be in the right pelvic position. So you're not stressing what you shouldn't stress. They have to be active in that position. Um, They have to be, you know, if someone's not flexible and you over split them, like it, it defeats the purpose of, they're not even stretching because it's so like outside of their wheelhouse. Like they're better off just going on the floor. It's going to be a way more effective stretch. So I screen in the sense of like, it's got to be an effective solution for them. And after a certain point, like if they can over split on one panel mat, why do I need to add two? Why do we need, like, why do we need to, it's not this like who can get the most over split, you know? And Mm -hmm. the athletes that I do have really, really good flexibility uh, I tend to say, Hey, they're over splitting. You need to go do some stability stuff. Right. So, you know, they tend to over split less than, than others. So mm. I use them. It's appropriate, but kind of like we've said this whole, whole time, you have to know what your goal is, what you're looking for and why you're using it. Um, and it has to be active. That's kind of the biggest thing. It can't just be hanging out there. Cause that's, uh, that can be dangerous over time to those, to the um, structures we've talked about. Totally. And I think again, just to bring back up the point of the original, which was the, the bone, then the joint capsule and the labrum are those static stabilizers that are typically more naturally hypermobile in someone already. So if you have an athlete who has, they're growing or they've done a lot of training and they're groin, their quads are stiff and their split is not coming along or it's, it's, it's losing ground. When you push or just put someone up in an oversplit, what happens is the motion follows the path of least resistance, which is the already hypermobile joint capsule or the already kind of, you know, wiggly, uh, labral motion happening there. So you're probably going to get, if it does go lower and let's just say this now, if you push someone down, which you should not do, you are probably only getting more motion from the joint itself, even though they might feel a stretch in their hip flexor or in their quad. Remember, it's directly on top of the joint capsule in the labrum. So unless you got MRI x-ray vision, how do you know whether that discomfort they're feeling is coming from the labrum and the joint capsule or something deeper, or it's coming from the hip flexor itself? You don't know. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you, you can't oh, know. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, so you can't know. Like you can't separate that stuff out. That's why understanding like what we're getting is so important because it it just hurts. They can't like as an athlete, you can't say, Oh, that's my labrum. You're putting like that hurts. My labrum is it's, there's so many things in that joint that have lots of pain receptors that um, you can get irritated and pinched and stretched and slide around. That is really um, dangerous to do over and over again. For sure. And then with that, so the corrected kind of approach, this would be one is this is where you need to do a screen, right? If someone doesn't have a split, you need to have either you do it or somebody else does it. And you have to understand is the hip flexor, the quad, the groin, the hamstring, the sciatic nerve tension. Like you will find a few things that are um, poking out is like, oh, that's the thing I need to work on. So you can kind of create a circuit around those are the areas we want to target and then maybe do a split at the end. But I also think this is a situation where to your point, like you said, somebody has to be very active in their stretching. So if you find someone who has a, um, has a full split and they're trying to do a switch ring, for example, and they're trying to get that over 180, that's really aesthetically pleasing. They should have their full split. You can work a one panel plus, right. If they're, if they're working towards it, but that person should be very focused, very present, very active in their stretching. And if they have clearly an oversplit on a panel or more is, is more than enough that they need. The goal should then be transitioning that over to active flexibility into getting those angles actively with hip strength and with those end range, hip flexibility, assisted band work. That's how you're going to get that to actually show up inside of your skills and your routines, doing an oversplit and going to beam is not going to make that show up. Right? No, absolutely not. And I think that's a big part we miss is, you know, we see someone who's not flexible and we nothing to say, you need to stretch. Well, they stretch and maybe they get full splits, but then what? Like there's so much that goes into that transfer physically and neurologically from a split on the floor into a split on the beam or a in bar or an aerial or just any active skill that we can't expect. It's foolish to expect that we would go from an over split to a 180 leap without some step in between. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the way to kind of summarize this point is to say like, okay, the thing we're trying to move away from is very aggressive methods that are ethically wrong and you're going to get in trouble because they're awful, but also just straight up passively stretching over splits again, not maliciously, 
The reason is because it puts more, it's probably going to put more pressure on the joint capsule, the labrum, the things that are already hypermobile, the, the static stabilizers. And instead, what you do is you follow the research based supported things that do help with range of motion over time, but you do them in a way that is specifically bias towards the muscles, right? So screen out what's the main issue. So say you, you do truly find someone's hip flexors are like mega stiff, right? Well, when you give someone a circuit, what, what things can be helpful with that is that definitely some soft tissue work and or foam rolling might help. It's hard to get the hip flexor, but when we stretch, we want to make sure we're doing a specific stretch to the musculature. And I think this is a really good example, which is like a true hip flexor stretch, which is like a very hollow position, squeezing the glute. It doesn't look like that deep, super aggressive lunge that a, a dance might give somebody or that classic overstretch. But the reason we're saying change that is because look at where this, the hip flexor muscle starts from. It starts from the spine. So all of these things, the psoas, the iliacus, they very much are on the spine and on the pelvis. So when you arch, a ton in a stretch, you're slacking the muscles you're trying to stretch. And so what happens is that deep end range is actually probably going to feel more from the joint capsule or bias the ligaments versus if you do something like this, which is really hollow your pelvis under, squeeze the glute on this side and push down with the hands to make the core contract. When you slide forward, you'll probably still feel a big old hip flexor stretch, but that's not coming from the joint capsule. That's biasing the muscles, right? So that's an example of something that still needs to change, which is everyone doing these super deep lunges. Cause you know, for Dan, for choreography i get the point that could be appropriate but if you're trying to stretch someone's hip flexor or someone's quad with this leg bent up you're probably better off doing like a true hip flexor or a quad stretch which biases the muscles right yeah absolutely that's i mean that's so important with all the drills that we do is to find you know whether it's a hip flexor or a quad stretch like get to the position where you're stretching the muscle and that might mean you're backing off a little bit mm -hmm. because how many times do you know we put our back leg up against the wall. So the knee is bent and then you're doing that same stretch lunging forward since it's a split stretch and you know, you ask where they feel it and it's, it's not where we want it and it's really backing off. And then all of a sudden, if we get into that right, that correct position, it's, you know, they feel a stretch and they feel a really good muscle stretch. Mm. And sometimes it just takes getting in that right position to be effective. Exactly. And I think between the two of us, you know, in 15 years of treating people, we've probably treated close to a thousand people for hip pain and hip injuries and gymnastics. And probably the number one thing we're doing is educating them on exactly what we're talking about and replacing their deep end range stretching with true soft tissue work. So quick soft tissue work, foam roll of your groin, your quads, your hamstrings. And then we're going to do a true hip flexor stretch for 30 seconds, a true quad stretch, some adductor rocks and some leg lowers maybe. And again, these are all on YouTube, so you can see them for free. And then maybe we're going to go do some specific uh active flexible or uh, eccentric work you know to try to lengthen those muscles over time so maybe we have a very squared up hip and we're doing split sliders with our hands on panel mats slowly going out into a split until we feel a stretch with our hips square holding for five seconds then coming back up with our hands or some eccentric loaded dumbbell rdls for hamstring stiffness we could do some rear foot elevated split squats if someone has quad or hip flexor stiffness you can use these things because they're supported by research of soft tissue work slowly consistently stretching every single day, five to six days per week, two sets of 30 seconds per muscle group, right? So 30 seconds, really static or dynamic or active, then go do some eccentric, then go do some active flexibility with the bands, do that in a circuit. That's a good replacement for that, like, you know, two minute plus, um, over split and something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably personally for me in the last five years of my um, career and coaching is the shift that I've, um, taken because it does, it hits every piece of what you need to, to do to see results. And I think that that's, um, that's huge, especially the consistency. Consistency is so hard, but it's so important. Um, and then the eccentrics and using these other very, very effective and research proven methods of enhancing actual muscle length. Mm, exactly. And I think I'm, I'm pulling up the, uh, the systematic review from Thomas, cause we'll get into this a little bit, but I think with the, the concept of consistency, which is so hard, right? Like you and I are coaches. I understand you get kids twice a week that are trying to stretch and getting it home is impossible, but this is where it's a little bit of an art form of coaching, which is you're going to do a warm up. So if you can get a dynamic warm up and get some stuff inside of there, that's it. If you can add in some active flexibility and, or some of these eccentrics on the side of a beam circuit on the side of a you know, bar station for shoulders. If that's what you're working on, you can sprinkle in a little bit there. And then who knows, maybe you can get them 
if they're really dedicated and they want to get their flexibility better, they're going to have to do something on their own. So maybe they can stretch while they're watching Netflix when they're hanging out at home, or maybe they can do some like 15 minutes here or there. Like if we just sprinkle in a little bit, it's very, very effective if it's built off a screen, right? If I, I, I've had so many people who come to me and you screen out just one or two things, I'm like, here's five things to do every single day versus this laundry list of an hour long of stretching and exercise and stuff like that. Just do these three things every day while you're watching TV or while you're hanging out and just come back and do it every single day, five to six days per week for four to six weeks. And then we'll come back. And if it's not working, we'll change something. But if you've screened out, it's not a bony thing and you understand that they're stretching correctly and how to do it, they're doing the right intensity and duration. It, it does work. It does make significant progress. It's just boring and takes yeah. a long time and it's frustrating, but that's gymnastics. That's what makes you good, you know? Yeah. And I think you said the thing you said was four to six weeks, right? Like yeah. we have to recognize that we want results fast. Like gymnasts want it fast. We want it fast. And four to six weeks maybe sounds quick, but in the middle of training or getting ready for competition season, it implementing something like that consistently for four to six weeks seems like a long period of time. But the results that you get out of it, in my opinion, really outweigh the amount of time it takes to do every single day in that consistency piece. Because, you know, Everybody wants leaps to 180. Everybody wants to be able to do these skills that have the flexibility. So if you're willing to invest consistently, like the outcome can be so great, but it is hard. It's hard, but it's important to recognize going into it that it is four to six weeks. Mm. Um, sure. Yes. Yes. And the thing that just popped into my mind before we move on to long duration stretching is we have to understand and respect that there are different disciplines in gymnastics and that rhythmic, for example, does require quite a bit more range of motion artistically or dance or ballet or something than maybe an artistic gymnast does or something yeah. like that, or a TNT athlete. And so with that being said, while you, yes, may spend more time and you might spend more of your uh, allotment of practice to flexibility methods, it's not an excuse to go more intense. And I think that's what I see, which is like, because rhythmic gymnastics requires switch rings are really aggressive in terms of their range of motion demands. You'll see people doing like between chairs, right? Like crazy, like over splits and stuff like that. Realizing that it's not so much about how hard you're stretching. It's how consistent and how often you're stretching and the methods that you're using behind that screening flexibility for eccentric stuff like that. That is what's going to get you your long-term progress and your goals. And so I think that's important to remember is like, yes, we understand and we respect that extreme range of motion are part of gymnastics, but with that comes the need to do a lot more active flexibility work and a lot more time. But you have to remember is that rhythmic gymnasts are not doing aminars, right? They're not doing right. double doubles on floor. Their hips are not taking 14 to 18 times body weight and forces that is happening in artistic gymnastics. So in artistic gymnastics, which is the main you know, population that we see these issues with is that they're trying to have the best of both worlds. They're trying to get insanely flexible and have insanely high strength and be insanely high capacity to land is right. not going to happen like that. You can't trade off and have the, the extremes of all those bell curves. Yeah. You know, rhythmic gymnastics gains range of motion at the expense of landing yeah. forces, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing to tackle, which is what, uh, something I did growing up literally every day was two minute, right split, two minute left split, two minute middle split, two minute pike hold, two minute pancake hold all the time. So yep. what is the thought process on the dangers or the concerns for really long duration stretching? So like two plus minutes, which a lot of people are doing, or even like a minute and a half to two minutes. Yeah. You start stressing those structures that we've talked about. So you start getting out of potentially some muscle stuff and into more of a ligaments, uh, capsule, labral stretch, irritation, um, overload situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know you've dove into this before, so I won't, you know, do too much, but what are we like, what's the difference? Like, what are we changing? Cause if the idea to stretch is to stretch a muscle by going two minutes, like research doesn't show that you get more stretch benefit mm -hmm. for two minutes. So really you're just harming what we don't want to stretch by staying in it longer and not actually getting more muscle lengthening. Exactly. And I think this is, there's a lot of papers on this, which people probably don't care about determining like why does stretching work? Like desensitizing versus, you know, muscle lengthening. 
spoiler alert, the majority of it is that we're just desensitizing. You're like, you're learning to just deal with the discomfort of stretching and entering so your body adapts to getting more and more mobile. But this is a great systematic review that we, we check out all the time from Thomas and at all is uh, 2018. They essentially looked at all the literature on stretching on range of motion. So what, what's the dosage and or frequency of stretching that's optimal and the type of stretching. And people should definitely look this paper up, but I can highlight some of the main um, bar charts that are kind of cool to see this, which is, I don't remember exactly how many studies where they were, but it's definitely a lot. So the first one here is they look at the types of stretching and what increases range of motion. So static, active, passive, ballistic, PNF, pretty much everything a gymnast would do is in there. And you can see that static stretching actually is useful. So there's like a huge debate about like, should I never static stretch? Should I always dynamic stretch? At the beginning of a warm up, it's probably more ideal to do a dynamic stretch and warm up because you're trying to get the body running and going for practice, you're trying to ramp up the nervous system, you're trying to get blood flow, get the get the blood pumping. But adding in a little bit of static stretching to get certain positions, a true hip flexor stretch, you know, a groin rock back, that's not going to be the end of the world. People have the unfortunately headline reading of like, Oh, if I static stretch all my power goes down, but those studies were literally static stretch for two minutes, then go max squat back, right. back squat, or go sprint maximal effort. Like, yes, if you sit there for two and a half minutes, your nervous system calms down, you probably won't be the most powerful, but other studies came out and showed that if you static stretch, then do a dynamic warm up after that, the power comes right back up. So if you add a little static stretching into the beginning with little ones, this is really important for compulsories to know, like my leg goes here, my arm goes here. Like Getting them to dynamically warm up is impossible. So static stretching, but the key here is that maybe ballistic is down here and I would not recommend people do ballistic stretching for other reasons, but static and active and passive are all really close on their effects of increasing range of motion and PNF is not far off either. So shocker, they all work when consistently done, right? So that's that's the first chart to check out. The second chart down here is, is again, the time spent stretching per week that actually significantly increase range of motion. And this is where that two sets of 30 seconds comes to because two sets of 30 seconds, five to six days per week is about five to 10 minutes of total dosage throughout the week. So that's kind of where that recommended two by 30 sets comes from. And then down here, a couple of the importance that we were just talking about. So here's this bar chart looking at the differences in studies that stretched one static stretch under 60 seconds or between one and two minutes and uh, greater than two minutes. And then I'm not going to say you have to be a scientist to tell you that these bar charts look awfully similar, right? So that's kind of the takeaway here is that the studies that did two, three, four, five minute stretches were fractionally better than the ones that did 60 to 120 seconds. So when I got to get through right leg split, left leg split, pike, straddle, pancake, every one going for two minutes, that's 10, 15 minutes. Then it's like herding cats to get them warmed up in the right position. Like you're going to get almost as effective a dose with the 60 second mark. Again, it goes back to consistency and screening. So that's that one. And then this is a really cool chart as well. This is the frequency of optimal days. So the studies that did two days a week, three days a week, five days a week, the most effective one is six days per week here. So five to six days per week seems to be your, your goal for consistency over the course of four to six weeks. So yeah, sorry for the long winded dorkiness there, but that is just a, a really good study to lean on when someone's like, I'm doing two minutes and you go, why? <laughs> and then you can kind of come back to be like, well, you know, extra some, some, yeah. Some, some. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I will say that that's 30 seconds of a correct position, proper hold act. Like everything's like, as a coach, my biggest pet peeve is when I say, okay, pike stretch. And I turn around, they're all picking their toes. Like, <laughs> that's not an effective 30 second stretch. So, right. you know, that's, it is the only 30 seconds, but that's like an, in, like a focused 30 seconds um, yes. that is important. I think sometimes, and I've done this is like, I say minute and a half, cause I know I'm only going to get 30 seconds of focused stretching. Right. And that's where as a coach, you know, maybe we need to be more engaged and active and, and calling out these, okay, get in your position. You're going to hold it, pull up square 30 seconds as we encourage them to be engaged for those 30 seconds. So we don't have to do two minutes because even, even then, if you get in two minutes, if you only get 30 seconds of good stretching, you're still jeopardizing mm. structures that we don't want to jeopardize. So I think that's, mm -hmm. especially when, you know, we're talking about sometimes like seven, eight, nine year olds and focusing for 30 seconds and a split is hard. So it yeah. is, there is that point to it too. It's like, it's a, it's an actively focused 30 seconds. For sure. And I can kind of already feel the emails uh, typing away. I'm like, okay, what would you do? Like you have 15 minutes. What would you do instead of a practice? And so right. I will quickly, and these videos are online in shifts, like video format. So just very quickly, the categories that you want to try to hit to are after you screen these things out, but you want to get soft tissue prep and or work, some sort of stretching, 
some sort of eccentric work, active flexibility, and then transfer that to technique. So if you had someone who wants to get their right and left split better, you would do foam roll your quad and your hamstring and your groin, true hip flexor and quad stretch for about 30 seconds. You would then maybe go do some um, loaded eccentric split squats, and then you would go and do maybe some uh, band assisted kicks, five or 10 of those. And then you would go over and go to tumble track and do jumps. You do five, maybe two to three circuits of that would be, I guess, summarizing all the evidence-based recommendations of the best dosage and frequency. If you wanted to do something for uh, groin, for example, for straddle, you could do the same soft tissue work to your groin and quad. You could do some adductor rock backs or some uh, half kneeling uh, adductor mobilizations. You could maybe go do split sliders, right? Because that's a great eccentric thing. Maybe you don't want to get the dumbbells out and do it, but maybe you do front split sliders for the front and then lateral uh, groin sliders for the second. Then you go do some, uh, band assisted, uh, straddle lifts. And then you go do straddle jumps on tumble track. If you were trying to get your hamstrings or pike better, maybe it would be foam roll your hamstrings, do some leg lowers off the edge of a block. Maybe you do some leg drivers where you're kicking your leg back up with your foot on the block. And then you go do, uh, you know, two sets of drills where you jump to a good pike swing on a strap bar or on a floor bar. And then you go do backward pike rolls or something like that. Like those are just very easy. And like, that's years of me Royally being frustrated trying to figure out what to fit in 15 minutes you can set three stations up and have the kids ro to rotate through like congo line so that's my experience but from your coaching side like other other things that you're doing or no um i mean sometimes i modify drills a little bit based on the athlete but i would say in terms of structure that's very very similar um i definitely focus on eccentrics more now than i used to because of just they're they can be so effective on multiple levels and for flexibility for muscle lengthening for strength all that stuff so i'd say I do a lot more eccentrics than i used to but that pattern of or like thought process in terms of 15 minutes what are you going to do very mm -hmm. similar yeah and i think that's the whole concept of like practically applying research to something that's digestible and usable for the average coach is like you're trying to sprinkle in consistency throughout the entire week right so maybe the dynamic warm-up serves as one area you know if you're blessed where the kids will come in early 15 minutes and do some stuff on their own it doesn't always happen with school that's another way to get it. The second is side stations. Like we said, you add, you know, one of your slit sliders on your jumps and leap station, you add something on bars for shoulder flexibility. And there's also the ability to maybe have one day per week. That's a little bit of a lighter day where you maybe just do all band assisted kicks or a kick circuit or something like that. You can kind of do one of those complexes there as well. You can find warmups are great too, as well. Like a beam warmup can add in some of these things too, as well. There's lots of opportunities to add in a little bit of each thing and cumulatively all together, they make a pretty substantial difference. Again, if they're really done with high quality and they're a focus of, of your culture, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. So let's get to the last one here, which is the, the need to individualize things and to not just mass apply uh, flexibility drills from Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or something like that, which also comes to the conversation of like, is three full over splits realistic and possible for gymnasts? And do you even need that to be successful? You know, right. Um, is it possible for some? And I would argue that if they have them, there's probably an underlying bony anatomy that works in their favor. Yep. Um, so it kind of makes me nervous if they have all three, because I'm thinking we're really going to have to work stability and end range strength here. Cause I don't want this to be a problem. So sure. I, I do think it's possible. And once you get to eight, nine, 10 and arguably lower, you have to have a full split. Like that's, right. It, right. it's part of the sport. So all three, I think is unrealistic for a lot of athletes just based on, you know, that's why we screen and determine, yep. you know, what, what is possible for this athlete. So it might be one, it might be two. Uh, it just depends. And that's why screening is important. I do think it's possible. Mm -hmm. but it's unrealistic to expect all three without repercussions. Okay. And then on that note, which is I'm the most guilty of this is you go to Congress, you watch YouTube lectures, like whatever. And you're like, Oh my God, that like such a great drill. Back leg gets up like real locked out and you go to the gym and you have 20 kids and you have them all do it in a circuit. What is maybe the concern for mass applying a drill like that? Mm -hmm. Is you're going to get, I'm sure within a group of 20 athletes, you have some that just grew. You have some that potentially don't understand it and are compensating because maybe, you know, they don't have the flexibility for soft tissue reasons. And so they're trying to get their back leg up and now they're arching their back or they're twisting sideways or you see weird things. Um, and then you have some that are so flexible, they can do it super easily, but they're not actively engaged. And now they're just, they're kicking without actual engagement or 
proper technique. And so they're irritating their labrum and you end up with several different sort of buckets of these problems that we've talked about. That's just going to end up causing problems individually for these mm-hmm. separate athletes, depending on, you know, kind of where they fall. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then being as someone who has been in the trenches coaching wise is the alternative here is to offer a few different options for someone at a station or during a drill circuit. And you frame it up as everyone has different backgrounds, injuries, goals, growth rates, like the same way that some are good on bars, some are great on vault, some are good on floor, some are good on trampoline, whatever. Like you have to say, like, we all have different goals and things that are good or bad. And we all have to work on them. So like, we're going to get to the station over here. And for someone who is, you know, really, really uh, hyper mobile, and they don't have any problems with splits, you can do the band resisted um, jumps, right? For someone who is struggling a little bit, don't worry about the bands, just do them without the bands, right? For somebody who is definitely on the stiffer side, but that athlete's probably more powerful, they can do the band assisted version, right? So you have three options, the exact same one by one foot square you're working in. And you just have a band there. Like if you're really good band resistance, if you're just in the middle, no band at all. If you need a lot of help band assistance, you'll work your way up in the same way that if somebody struggled super with, uh, giants, I wouldn't be like everyone do giants, right? I'd be like, well, let me watch your giant and figure out is it the handstand? Is it the fall down? Is it the tap? Is it the shaping? Is it the eye sight? Like I'd try to reverse engineer what the main problem was. And I'd have a handful of different drills that somebody could go do to work on that specific issue. That's like very constructive, thoughtful coaching. And you have to have the same lens towards flexibility and leaps and jumps and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, as a classic example, just the other day, I saw an athlete who does a lot of uh, working a lot of like toe, like toe shoots, um, step in, dismount, like all that sort of stuff. And they're trying to do pike flexibility and like she, she can't reach her toes, but she can do these in bars, but it's it's all nerve. Mm. And so, do, you know, I, I screened it because like this doesn't make sense. But whenever we do flexibility or whenever they do flexibility for pike stuff, she does more neural tension drills because she doesn't fit that group who needs to do pike flexibility because it's only going to flare up you know neurological issues so Mm -hmm. um that's just another example of like screening and having the different options um for sure so important and even on that too is like from a coaching point of view when you start to make your prehab circuits or your flexibility circuits is you can kind of have two different tracks so to speak on those that are more hyper mobile and need more strength and stability and those that are a little bit more stiff and need a little bit more mobility work but they're typically stronger and they have a lot of power so you can either make the same circuit and say like okay it's going to be uh soft tissue work hip flexor quad stretch um hip lifts and some sort of uh, slider drill and then some sort of like jumps and leaps to the end you can tell the more hypermobile athletes to go kind of easier on the stretching and easier on the soft tissue work but spend a lot of their time maybe do two extra rounds of the jumps and the active flexibility drills versus the athletes that are really stiff they can spend a little bit more time on the soft tissue work and the stretching and the eccentrics and maybe just do one set of the active flexibility drills. so you can i used to just write out on a whiteboard like almost like two forks of like okay if you're more f- Gumby, you're on this side. If you're more a little bit stiffer, you're on this side. And you just go through the same way that if somebody was doing a strength program and one poor child just struggles with upper body strength, you wouldn't make her do 30 pull-ups is the same as like Sally over here who's just repping them out, right? You do you want to find different versions for them to work on. Yeah, absolutely. I do the same thing. I split it up and make sure that there's kind of that hey, you're the flexible more flexible group, you're the little tighter group. We're gonna individualize this to to what, you know, help will benefit you the most. So that's definitely, and they appreciate that. Like they appreciate the recognizing, like recognizing, Hey, I need more of this work. I need more of that work. And they're, um, definitely engaged more with it. So I I've done that and that's been hugely helpful for, for me coaching at least. For sure. And the, and the last point to wrap this up too is, almost without fail, you and I see so many people who are 12, they go through a growth spurt, they lose their flexibility and they come to the clinic and they're like, give me the magic exercise for, to get my splits back. And there's really no easy answer, right? It's like, you're growing, this is just a part of it. And you have to consistently stretch or do flexibility work and you got to back off, right? You got to back off on the switch leaps and the jumps. And maybe it's a little bit less difficult routine, or maybe it's a couple less meets or it's just whatever. But like, I promise you that pushing through and trying to just stretch more aggressively and go harder on it is only going to lead to growth plate crankiness or some, some fire, some, some backfire on, you know, the joint gets sore and it tightens up more so. So it's just like, it's so, it's so tough because we all want everyone to, to be reaching their goals and making progress. But like, 
the reality of the sport is that 10 to 14 year olds are growing rapidly and it's very hard for them to keep up with such an aggressively flexible flexibility demanding sport. If you either force it or you try to keep doing those skills, like a back walkover, for example, something is going to move extra to make up for the lack of hip motion, probably their lower back, right? Or probably something like that. So you're going to, you're going to cause quite a bit of an issue, uh, elsewhere. So you got to slow down. You got to be patient. You got to realize this is a long five, 10, 15 year journey, maybe for the rest of their life. But yeah. Yeah. And if you, you know, someone grows and you keep pushing through it, that labral issue that you create now mm. isn't going to go away. It's going to keep popping up every, you know, who knows how frequently for that athlete. And, um, you know, it could really hurt their career once they start, you know, level nine, level 10 college, stuff like that. So, right. you know, the decision you make is protecting them in that moment, but also longevity wise for being a human. Yeah, for sure. And I think that requires back to the whole, like kind of cultural, moral, ethical is you're going to have to take some quote unquote heat, maybe from other coaches or parents or whoever else and be like, why is the split not up? What do we got to do? And this and that, you should be like, well, just growing. And, you know, maybe we won't have the most stellar year of performance in form wise, but it's okay. We're going to have healthy hips that can go two, four, five, eight, a thousand more years. So that's really the, the end goal on the other side, you know? And I think to maybe wrap this up is I'd, I'd like to just kind of summarize with, in your opinion, because obviously you've gone through hip issues is like when we're doing stretching work, when we're doing flexibility work, what are maybe the signs that it's an appropriate level of discomfort versus something that's like not, uh, yeah. not ideal. Sure. I, it's subjective, but I use like a three out of 10. So mm -hmm. when they're stretching, I kind of say like, this should feel like a mild to moderate stretch. I'm looking for a three out of 10, 10 being like, it's going to snap in half one being like, you really don't, you're not doing much. So I kind of try to give them a gauge and then let them do fill that with whatever they understand that to be. So I'm getting a mild to moderate stretch. Um, they're still able to be active. They're not crying. They're not compensating. They're not in some funky position because it's too much or stressing the wrong thing. So I use a, I use a three out of 10 gauge. They should not be sore the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and it should not inhibit their practice. Like they shouldn't stretch over splits and then not be able to vault because they yep. can't run anymore. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that window is really important, right? For all like strength training sometimes has like a two day hangover, but like for stretching work and other stuff like that, generally speaking, flexibility work and or drill work or stuff like that should be, like you said, a moderate discomfort. You should feel that generally like in the muscle belly itself, not really high up where the bones attached to. So study your anatomy of where the tendons attached to. Um, but also it should resolve within 24 hours for sure. So if you, if you maybe went too hard or they went too hard, you said like back off and they didn't really know. And like, they are limping around or they like really can't get their splits the next day. Like probably was a little bit too aggressive and we need to again, back off and double down on frequency, not so much intensity. Yeah, definitely. Well, this was extremely educational. I hope people, uh, we're okay with our tone of being a uh, tough love, but hopefully helpful more so in that. But um, yeah. So with your background and everything that you're going through, is there anything else that you feel like we want to touch on or some parting advice or, or we, we pretty much got it all. I think the biggest like thing for like having gone through it, I think like my coaches were never malicious with it. Right. It was, they right. didn't, it was an education thing. We didn't have that available at that point in time. So I think it's, right. Like if you're someone doing these techniques, don't take this as like a direct attack on, on, on you, but as like a, Hey, this is information that we now have. Let's use it to better our athletes, the longevity, our sport, um, and kind of take it, like you said, as a tough love, but like, this is really exciting. We now have this sure. um, available. Yeah. And for sure. And, and my parting advice on that would be you know, there is an abundance of available information, whether it's this podcast, whether it's articles, whatever medium you want to use to digest it. Um, if you are in a situation where at your gym or you're a parent, you're a coach who notices this happening, or you're just an athlete who wants to bring this up to your coaches, like you can just politely open the conversation about like, oh, this is so interesting. I was like, listen to this podcast. Or I heard this thing. And I think that like, this might be really helpful. Like, you know, do you mind if I send you some stuff? Can we talk about it? Can we have a meeting? Can we try? Can we just give it a whirl for a couple of weeks? And just slowly bite off a couple exercises, a couple things here and there, change this, not that, you know, and just, just slowly build uh, into something different. Like, I think I made the mistake of like trying to kick the door down and be like, all these things are going to change. And it's really, really tough because nobody wants to feel as though they're doing something wrong and they don't want to feel as though they're kind of getting, 
um, I guess like put in the limelight of like making a mistake. It's more just like, Hey, new information comes out and we learn new things. We try new things and let's all just tackle this together. And, but by giving them a podcast or giving them a book or giving them a research article, it feels as though they're in charge of helping promote the change. And it's much more on board with, right. So that would be my kind of, I just like, uh, emotional intelligence application is trying to do that. And then it has to be said, but if you want to change these things and someone's, you know, using aggressive flexibility methods or they're not following any new ideas, they're just stuck in this like super old school mindset. You have to, you can approach it with trying to change, but if they're really not even open to hearing what you said, you have to step in, right? As a parent, as a coach, as a gymnast, you guys are like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, like my hips are my hips and I have them for the rest of my life. And so I'm not going to get my hips destroyed just because you think it's right. And like, kind of put your foot down and say like, no, we're not doing that or leave, like leave the gym. Don't do what they're doing because it's not worth it. And I, I hate to be at that level sometimes, but rarely, but there are times when it's like, people are like, well, what do I do? I'm like, leave the gym, move on, go somewhere else because you're going to have to pay for the medical bill when it comes and they're just going to move on. So yeah, not to end on a somber note, but <laughs> um, cool. Uh, Cage, any social media to find you at? Or are you putting things out or are you just kind of like chilling in your own little world? I don't even know. Well, I mean, I, I am chilling my own little world, but um, I'm on Instagram, the resilient athlete uh, 22. I do That's put um, some content out in terms of kind of a lot of what we talked about, just um, kind of research backed methods for um, whether it's weight training and eccentrics and flexibility or um, just kind of basic injury um, awareness. So I am on there. Um, Sounds good. That's that's the main one. All right. Keish, thank you so much for the chat and the time. I think this podcast will be very helpful. So I appreciate you hanging out. Yes. Thank you. It's an honor. And um, I'm just humbled by the work you put out every day. So thank you. <laughs> Flattered by that. Have a good weekend. You too.